give me a second. Um, welcome to yet another session. And uh, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to train you on how to write in a technical, um, in a correct way, in a technical writing. What is the technical writing? Can you see my page okay? Yes. Technical writing basically is, is known. If I give you this word, like technical writing, what do you imply? If I ask you, what do you think about technical writing? What is technical writing from your point of view? What do you say? Um, talking with technique. Exactly. So you might think like, okay, if I am writing in a technical way, in more, in more like is a scientific writing or is a technical manual or is a documentation that we're doing. To be honest with you, any technical way, um, you might be right if you're addressing your audience with more technical terms, technical words, a technical knowledge. If you're, for example, an, a computer engineer and you're talking to your audience, you're having that digital tool or the technical tool um, in technical communication. But there is another window of technical communication. Technical communication is basically an umbrella, is a big term, is a big, is a vast phrase or compound noun that is addressing even if in business you're writing the correspondence email exchanging that you're having it is non-fiction of course it is it is um it is the truth that you're exchanging and day-to-day -day communication by email it might it might need that kind of a technical technical terminology technical material um, if there is an instruction that's a technical specification and so on so technical technical writing and technical communication is not only getting limited to technical words. What we're going to do today, I'm going to train you on technical communication and the skill for technical communication, because any correspondence that you have with your professors, with your, um, with your hiring managers, soon to be um, the universities that you apply and so on, will be considered as the official technical communication. The courses that are known, um, as, as it can be seen, the reality of the technical term is, in general, imagine that when you're discussing in te technical communication, te you discuss something in technical communication, you are solving the problem in an analytical way. So what we're going to do today, we're going to learn about how to communicate in a technical way and how to problem solve the scenarios that we have and how to analyze the scenario to solve the issues. It's going to be a pretty interesting session. So we're going to hammer and we're going to review problem solving approach in communication. We're going to talk about the conventions conversations, communication, and the characteristics of rhetorical situation, case studies, and in the writing process. So in general, if I say technical communication, I am specifically addressing that um, problem solving, as well as um, rhetorical writing, case studies, and so on and so forth. So far, so good? No question? Yeah, I'm good. So the technical writing that, um, that we're going to discuss is all about um, how you approach these kind of case studies and how you solve the issues. As I mentioned, like 25% to 50% of technical communication is problem solving. You're having an email communication with your peer, with your professor. You just try to figure out how to solve something. An issue happened, you start communicating. 25% to 50% is problem solving to some kind. But 50 to 75% is the way that you communicate in writing. You read the report, you analyze the issue. If there is a memo, if there's a proposal, if there's a simple email communication, there's a presentation discussion and so on. So it's very important. The first step is analyze the issue, try to figure out how you can solve that problem. And then while you're analyzing how you need to encode another kind of communication to be able to um, extend that kind of way of talking. So far so good, no questions? Yes. Excellent. So there are a variety of different types of technical writing. We have technical journals, marketing li literature, 
uh, consumer literature, reference information, online technical support, online help, and each specific field of the study will have some kind of jargons that they might use those kind of jargons within their technical communication. We're not going to hammer that because we don't know what field of study you're selecting for your university or the future, um, future your education life. But what we're going to do now, we're going to learn about problem solving. When you're having your, there, there are top five documents that everybody's using it. And in, in those kind of documents, they need to be able to solve the problem in order to have more, uh, I mean, better and tactful communication. The first type would be email communication, email reporting, formal reporting, letter, memo, or infographic type of thing. But within those um, type of correspondence, you need to have that technical style as well. So the most common question is um, when the students are writing an email, for example, you have a question, you want, you're confused about something, you want to ask your professor about that specific issue. That is considered as a technical writing. But you need to be clear about that problem that you have in your mind. The question is a problem you have it in your mind and then the way that you communicate it with your professor. Not to bore you, what I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to introduce you in a very simple way. Can you still see my page okay? Yes. Excellent. So, so we learned about what is the technical writing. It's not only technical language or jargons, but simple correspondence day to day. It is considered as technical writing because problem solving, analytical language is involved. What does it look like in simple way of thinking? Um, technical writing, there's a theme through it. For example, if, if I'm writing a, a passage about how can I make my boat point higher? Imagine this is the topic of my, of my article that I'm writing. Um, I need to think about sailing. I need to think about mast and centerboard. I need to think about jeep for lead. All these words are the um, jargons that are appropriate for, um, for sailing. I need to think about cleats. You see all these words are unknown to you. I need to think about traveler. So these words are known as jargons. In any technical writing, we need those specific jargons. Engineers, they have different jargons. Teachers, they have different jargons. Um, scientists, they have different jargons. Artists, they have different jargons, just to be familiar with. So vocabulary is the first um, way of proper correspondence and communicating with one another. Um, I'm gonna take you directly to how to organize your technical way. Another sample, this one is a, is a scientific sample. Imagine that NASA designed the process diagram. Um, they state the problem, they talk about the problem in NASA, and then they generate the ideas. They select the solution within those ideas that were generated, and then they build an item, and then they evaluate it, and then they present the result. Within this kind of process, you need that kind of technical language, right? In any ambience, technical language is absolutely essential for everyone to, to learn. But the question is how well the technical language can be understood. It's not only the creation. You need to be aware of that statement or the problem that is, um, that is introduced. The goal of the statement is also important. Finally, the objectives that you need to be clear about. This is, I'm giving you some examples, like one example was for sailing with different jargons. One example is the process of the scientific study at NASA. Now I'm gonna take you to communication as solution. So because technical writing is all designed for anyone in any sector, in any field of education or work to be able to communicate with the technical terms, as well as problem solving, it comes solving a problem, problem solution, and uh, communication as solution is, is something in common with any kind of 
field that the technical writing appears. So first of all, a most important step is to understand the problem. Analyzing the problem in any field is the first and foremost important. Idea generation, if you are working within the team, would be the next step as you saw that in that chart for NASA. You establish a goal. What is the goal? What are we going to do? Of course, time is always essential, the deadlines, and then the objectives that need to be. The objectives, they consider specific message that your audience need to hear. Basically, the solution to that problem that it was primarily introduced. So far, so good? Yes. I don't want to confuse you, but I just want to to clarify what it is to make the foundation absolutely ready before I take you to the case studies and um, so, so you need to think like a problem solver. An analytical thinker is extremely successful in um, technical writing. Um, we avoid he said, she said, we avoid emotions within technical writing in any kind of professional essay writings. Technical writing um, are like obviously appearing over there. Um, so the steps that quickly review the steps, I need to figure out the problem, figure out the situation. What is the goal to solve that problem? What are the measurable objectives? And what are your constraints? But that's a specific um, issue that you are analyzing. So. The characteristic of a problem is, um, is the first and foremost important thing in technical writing. So you realize what the problem is. When I take you to the case studies momentarily, you will see how important it is to know in details. And um, basically you break down one issue into smaller pieces in order to have better objectives, in order to find better solutions to them. The purpose in technical writing is to communicate technical and specialized information in a clear, accessible, use, usable manner to people who need to use that kind of decision. The audience depends on the sector, if it is engineering audience, if it is, for example, scientific audience, or it's just the public audience that you simply write um, your essay to. It is very important that your writing should be in a concise, clear, plain, active voice, most importantly, direct language. We talked about concise writing not long ago, and it may include specific terminology jargons that we discuss, and typically using the short sentences and paragraphs. The sentences are not going to be long because it's going to be confusing. Technical writing is specifically designed for the students to write at universities and higher um, educational institute. And uh, the tone is formal in technical writing. In any kind of technical writing, the tone is absolutely formal. And um, sometimes if the technical writing correspondence going back and forth, like for example, one time you send it to me and then the next time you receive an email, maybe after like a couple of correspondence exchange, the tone might drop to less formal tone. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. It's always courteous, it's always polite, but uh, less formal in it. Um, the structure must be highly structured, short paragraphs, clear transitions, and structural, uh, and structural um, cues. So headings and subheadings that they highlight the document organization. Um, I'm going to message uh, Carmen right now that you're here. <laughs> she, I think she wanted to make sure that, that everything is okay. So the format of technical writing can be in different formats. Specifically nowadays, everything is electronically done. Um, letters might be possible if it is the more formal setting, the letters to lawyers or the governments are still possible. And technical writing features are considered as ideas and evidences, solution to those problems as the objectives or the penultimate goals for, um, for that problem. Any questions so far? Um, I'm good. Excellent. So 
we're going to start understanding understanding the rhetorical situation. So some rhetorical situation. Now we're getting back to the easy day to day communication, and uh, and see how we can apply that technical writing within that uh, setting. Uh, rhetorical situation. Um, it is it is. I'm going to introduce it before anything else to you. It is common knowledge in uh, in the workplace that no one really wants to read what you write so people are rushing to read and they most of the time they misinterpret and misunderstand so if they want or they have to read it they will likely not read all of it unless it is right to the point that's why concise and direct and short writing to the point is absolutely essential paragraphs should be directly to the point they should only talk about non-fiction and facts and how you get your reader to understand the purpose. So we avoid wordy language, we introduce the problem, and we analyze the problem to figure out how we can solve the issue. So the task is you introduce a specific problem to the audience and the anal analyzing style. Of that. So the rhetorical situation is you are the writer, you have a purpose for writing that text message, email, letter, whatever the case may be. You have a group of audience that you select your tone. You have a group of audience that you specifically know the purpose of writing to. You create and encode the message and you check the text and the culture within the message. If the message is appropriately organized, if the message is appropriately um, typed, uh, the, 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 the grammatical situation is, is aligned, the vocabulary uh, is selected properly, and so on and so on. So we talked about the purpose, writer, audience, message, and context, and culture. So you're clear about that, and we talked about it. Now we're going to have some um, in here. I'm going to review. Um, first and foremost is the open-ending questions that you need to ask yourself when you're uh, creating and when you're writing that specific um, technical way. Who is talking to whom? About what? Where? How? And why? So open ending question and remember these five questions. If necessary, sometimes you don't need to answer one of these WH questions, but you need to have it in mind. Who you're writing an email to or technically writing to, who is your audience, to whom, and what is it about? Where is it located? Like through what medium, for example, you're specifically writing this correspondence how you're writing it, if it is formal, informal, semi-formal, and why are you writing it? Before you let anybody else analyze your audience and, and analyze the information that you're writing, you need to do that. So in short, understanding your relationship to your audience, you are considered um, having, for example, a supervisor, you're having a subordinate, you're having colleagues, team members, and so on. And then you're communicating to public supplies, clients, and, and us. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. So, sometimes in workplace, your audience and the purposes are need, in need of the reassessment. If my audience, um, if my audience, for example, is considered as a group of executives, they are making a decision. They're decision making. I need to know what they are. And then if they are supervisors, they are advising or decision makers as well, but maybe directly or indirectly. If they're managers, they're subordinates, for example, and technical experts or workers, they are decision makers, maybe in a third step. And if there is a public, for example, coming, I need to adjust my tone, my vocabulary, my grammar, my structure. Um, I'm going to directly take you because we talked about the purpose and so on and how you need to address this. This is the first case study that I want you to read carefully. And I'm going to read it with you. Then I'm going to ask you to start creating something. Is, is the page clear to you? Yes. I'll just try to make sure because I, I am on a small laptop computer. Just try to make sure that you can read it correctly. So. As a project manager, you're a project manager, uh, tree swing cartoon, this is the, this is the scenario. And um, no one knows the scenario is the cost of poor communication. So 
I want to show you why technical communication is important and how to avoid errors like that. At times, um, multi-billion dollar is involved in that communication that it might come to no good effect and the error will be really costly. So the cost of the poor communication, this is the story. No one knows exactly how much poor communication costs businesses, industries, government each year, specifically technical communication would be another one. And the number of the correspondence or emails that we receive, and specifically nowadays, but because of the nature of working online is insurmountable. So most of the time people are not reading it carefully or reading it in a rush. And then the message does not come properly. But estimates suggested billions. In fact, recent, recent estimate claims that the cost in the US alone is close to 4 billion annual, based on the research that Burnoff did in 2016, poorly worded in on inefficient email, careless reading or listening to instructions, uh, documents that go unread due to poor design, um, hastily presenting inaccurate information, sloppy proofreading, all of these examples are lack of technical writing, lack of proper technical writing, results in inevitable costs. So it's costly. To avoid that, specifically when you're going up, um, to, uh, you're continuing your um, academic life into higher education, it is very uh, important for you to know this technical writing. The problem is that these costs are not usually included on the corporate balance sheet at the end of each year, but the problem remains unsolved. So you may have seen the project manager tree cartoon. This is the cartoon. I'm gonna give you a few minutes momentarily to read, to analyze the process. Um, so tree cartoon, before this figure, it has been used and adapted widely to illustrate the perils of poor communication during a project. The project happened, but the communication didn't take place properly. The waste caused by um, imprecisely worded regulation and instruction, confusing email, long uh, winded memos, ambiguous writing, ambiguously written contracts, other examples of the poor communication is not as easy identified as the losses that it happened based on the a bridge collapse or the flood. So sometimes the risk-taking projects are just going um, insane. Look at this, look at the pictures and try to find the problem. Top left, it said how the customer explained it. The customer explained the problem, how the project leader understood it, how the engineer designed it, how the program wrote it, programmer, how the sales executive described it, how the project was documented, and how operation installed. So you see that in each picture, there is something missing. How the customer was, was built, expensive, how the help desk supported it and what the customer really needed. So from the top left picture to the lower right hand side picture is a huge difference. The customer wanted a very simple swing, for example, with the tire to be designed. The way that the customer explained it, it sounded like a complex swing with ladder shape or top that he could go, he could go up, the, up the tree. Does that make sense so far? Yes. The way the communication comes across, no wonder that nowadays most of university and college courses are in need of communication courses and, and university and colleges are providing to any kind of discipline because what people think is not what exactly they communicate and what exactly they receive. This is a very simple case study of how it happened, the money, the work, and the whole project was all over the place and no one understood the simple project and no one was just thinking of the simple project and no one was absolutely focusing on what exactly the simple project and how exactly it must be done. So going back to that simple question, you need to ask open-ending five questions.
so going back to the rhetorical, um, I'm going to take you back to the to the rhetorical situation. We need to figure out who the audience is what exactly the audience is asking the message. So the message was misunderstood. The way it was communicated to different department was not coming across. The way it was written was not completely thorough. And the purpose of that project didn't come, um, at the end didn't come valid and was not functional because everybody basically misunderstood the whole project. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you to another case. But with these cases, I want you to tell me how you would solve this issue. First, I'm going to take you to the tree project uh, problem. Um, within this, this project, many, um, many employees miscommunicated something. Can you, for each picture, for each role of that member who communicated something differently, can you think of a solution to this issue and try to find what was the problem primarily? Um, it's basically the, the, like there's something missing between the customer and the project leader. Like the, their like communication was poor so that like right after that, like each of the other people behind the like the project leader who received the message are like misunderstanding the message. Yeah, basically miscommunication happened like a domino effect. Primarily, I absolutely second that. I agree. The way that the customer explained to the project uh, manager was not clear enough. So the customer was saying something that it was misinterpreted how it was explained because the very first picture it was a very simple uh, design. And uh, however, the, the first simple design which was explained was nothing similar to the design that it was given. And each member following that was misunderstood by the next person, by the third person and so on and so forth. Perfect. What we're gonna do now, we're gonna work on cases studies and I want you to think and tell me how would you resolve these issues before we do anything practical? So can you see the case study two? Yes. Excellent. So it is called the unaccepted current regulator proposal. Um, read, read the scenario and tell me how would you think this problem would be solved? And I want you to use um, this specific model. Assess the process, assess the audience, assess the message, assess the context and culture, and then rewrite the message in the way that it should be read correctly. Would you like to take a picture of this specific model? I'm going to take you back to, did you, could you do that? Am I too I fast? Did. I did. You did? Okay. okay. Sometimes I'm too fast and I don't know why I am fast. <laughs> so I want you to read this, um, this scenario and uh, try to figure out how can you analyze this problem. And based on that model, I want you to be able to find the solution to that. So it is very important any topic that you're writing, you need to figure out what that topic is specifically asking you and what kind of solutions you need to write based on. If that is an essay, two, three solutions to that based on that problem with facts and as much as you can, it should be known. So the question is, Acme Electric Company work day and night to develop a new current regulator designed to cut the electric power consumption in aluminum plants by 35%. They knew that, although the competition was fierce, the regulator could be produced more cheaply, was more reliable, and worked more efficiently than the competitor's product. 
the owner eager to capture the market personally, but somewhat hastily put together a 120 page proposal and send it to the three major aluminum manufacturers recommending that their regulator be installed at all company plant. She devoted the first 87 pages of the proposal to the mathematical theory and engineering design behind this new regulator and the next 32 to description of the new assembly line she planned to set up to produce regulated quickly buried in an appendix where the test results that compared hair regulator performances with present models and a poorly drawn graph showed how much the dollar savings would be so that acne electric didn't get the contract despite having the best product six months later the company um, filed for bankruptcy what i want you to do i give you a minute another minute to read and then based on the model find the problem find the purpose find the issue and suggest the solution those solutions are just random we don't need to um, necessarily employ those solutions but all we need to do is just analyze it. the session is all about analyzing the topic analyzing the case study and being able to to evaluate and communicate in more technical way give you five minutes to read the problem again read the case study again and start analyzing and tell me how the situation could have been done differently Are you still with me, Celia? Yes. Excellent. Take your time and then tell me how you would have done differently. I just need to activate that kind of a problem solving mentality within you. I know that you have it, but just practice it in an actual setting. Yes.
think I got it. Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to for your speech to tell me how you analyze this problem and what do you think the issue was? So like the their what they wanted to do is basically like get the project before like other like companies like companies like get it before them. So like their problems started when they were like putting together the uh, 120 pages to the aluminum manufacturers without like really double check. Mm-hmm. And then after that, like, um, basically the owner like devoted the first 87 pages and um, let the next 32 um, descriptions to like be assembled. So like for this part, I personally think that like it's time consuming and it when she like the like like um reject like the thing it's it also like wastes like a lot of money so with um and the after this uh the um graph was also poorly drawn Mm -hmm. and which like the it let the outcome um, turn out what they wouldn't want it to be so like because their um, product wasn't good enough they end up like having a bankruptcy yeah the clarity of the message was not clear to to electric company itself i guess like she was not clear about the issue on its own. That's why she couldn't communicate that properly with the, um, after it is filed with bankruptcy and lack of concise communication, like 120 pages, like people don't read that, Mm -hmm. Um, specifically with the proposals and so on. Um, Length of communication and lack of clarity is uh, is a huge issue in in that case, but but good for you because um, because that was absolutely clear in that in that specific case. Um, when we are writing, the writing process is we need to define the problem. So first step in the technical writing is we define the problem. More than welcome to uh, take a picture. Sorry about that. Take a picture. You define the problem. When you define a problem in an issue or a simple email communication, you need assessment of that problem. Um, then you create the problem statement, clear, concise, direct language. Then you design the criteria and the goal. Of course, very much the same as the first graph. Background research is absolutely important to know the clarity, to know the problem. After that, we start generating possible solutions. Like in this case, I asked you, what do you think she should have done? You were right. You said like she she could have communicated in a different way. The graphs were not clear. She was not clear on its its own. Um, So the problem was not clearly given. Therefore, the graphs were not clear. The communication didn't come across after that. She should have done, for example, in that case, the previous case study, she should have evaluated possible solutions. And then she should have made and test the model before she sent those 120 uh, pages. I think she didn't test anything and she didn't assess anything. So this step was missing in that case. And then modifying and improving design, like editing, proofreading, and then narrowing it down rather than having poor graphs or 120 pages. And then final communication will come to good effect because all the steps were covered and nothing was missing. Um, To clarify the writing process um, diagram, I'm going to, let me open the, can you see the chart? Yes. Before I write anything um, in any, any setting, either an essay or the article or the proposal. I need to jot down my notes and have the pre-writing and then plan 
have the draft reflect on it to eliminate the errors. And then I need to have a second pair of eyes, ask my tutor, ask my peer to review, revise, edit, revise, edit. And I review this circle as much as I can up until the moment that I'm confident that the process is clear. Additional research might be in need and I should have done it before the planning. Before I let the last step to go, edit and proofreading, I need to review as much as I can. So far, so good. Yes. When we are planning for that st stage, I, in this and the planning stage, I need 40% of my time planning for the document, anything that I write. So basically, you need to have the technical 40% of the technical uh, plan to be done. You think, you analyze, you do the research, you jot down your notes and free writing, do the research, brainstorm, discuss it with someone who's in in, um, in the same field, for example, and familiar, you focus the ideas and so on. Then you start drafting. Drafting is extremely important. Drafting is usually 20% of the time when you write the draft. Um, maybe in this session, you're not practicing some exercises, but it's a lot of thorough knowledge on um, technical writing for you because soon or maybe already at, at um, in your, in your school, you're writing specific technical writing and you need to know um, what percentage you need to invest in any step of writing. Um, quickly, when you have an idea, you write down your ideas and we don't rush, uh, we complete those sentences and the sentences will be driven to and then taken all the way to the paragraphs and without agonizing. We check the style, we check the grammar, before revision uh, stage. Stage three is revising and most of the students miss this stage, unfortunately, and I don't know why. Like 60% is completed by planning and drafting, but then revision is, they're rushing. So the, the, the mistake in the previous case study that happened, it was just because of lack of, um, lack of revision and lack of um, proper timing. In, in planning. Revising and editing will show, like if she were um, revising and proofreading that graph, the bankruptcy wouldn't have happened. Any questions so far? I'm good. So in between these, uh, these three steps, 40, 20, 40, always remember your writing process should be thought thoroughly and analyzed in 40, 20, and 40. Uh, planning, drafting, revising, planning, drafting, and revising. And I personally noticed, because I marked many papers during the days and weeks and years, um, revision stage is usually missing or not fully at 40%. Is I either in 5% or maybe 10% or, or, or it's completely missing. So it is very important to have that 40, 20, 40. What I'm going to do... Uh, and I basically I'm going to take you to a good practice. Um, the key concept of the technical writing is, uh, is your audience focus. Your audience focus is known as reader's focus. I write not for, not for myself. I write the way that I want my audience to be clear, right? In order to, to have that, the first model that we talked about is your audience. You need to figure out who your target audience is in order to select the formality and informality of your, of your approach. And then you need to figure out what are their perspective? What is it that they know? And what is it that they need to know? If they know some kind of information, it is unnecessary, for example, like previous uh, cases study to to write down 120 pages because many of those details are something that they know. If my audience already knows about that, why would I need to add the same redundant content? In order to do that, I need to think about, think on behalf of the audience. So we write for the reader and we write on behalf of the reader center writing basically. And um, the goal of writing is First and foremost, what is the goal and what is it that I'm trying to say to, to, to the reader? And, and then what does my reader need to know? So whatever information that the reader knows, I don't need to say it again. 
and what is my reader's goal? What is my reader in need? What, what does my reader ask me to, to remind them or to tell them or to do the research and provide information for? Do I need to give them more than that? Yes, sir. Any questions so far? Um, no. Okay. Um, there are some negative and positive um, attitudes that we need to be aware of in writing. Um, we don't use negative tone or negative language. Um, this is a next step. It's called writing constructively. For example, um, I, don't, I, I don't say, oh, I misunderstood. You can say it is more constructive if I say I understood differently. So we use the positive verb with a different adjective, as long as the meaning is coming, coming across. It is negative if I say outraged. I would say, I'd better say conservatory. It is negative if I say disgusted. I'd better say pleased or not pleased, rather, right? Guilty or not capable, for example. Belittled or not empowered. So it is constructive to use positive verbs and positive adjectives and positive grammar or positive words. If you want to have the parallel meaning, you can add not plus the positive adjective. Instead of saying, for example, someone is fat, I would say they're not in shape. Which one sounds more positive? Maybe that sounds a little bit um, awkward because of the example that when you read it in the context, it, it comes across not very pleasant. Instead of saying exclude that team, I would say that team is having a sense of belonging. We need to review their uh, outcome and the assessment and so on. So to adjust that tone of writing with, uh, within the professional writing, you need to write in a constructive way. And we always and always and always avoid negative negative tone. I can't I can emphasize it more, but it, this chart is a good chart for you to take a look at it, like which one looks more um, pleasant in practice. Reader center is very important. Reader center and writer's writer center. If it is writer center, I say I, we most of the time that in most professional writing is usually reader center. Most probably it is better to say, um, address them as a company or address them in plural rather than the singular. Um, adult, adult approach is, is recommended as well. If it is the writer's center, I say, if I can answer any question, I'll be happy to do so. But if it is the reader center, I would say, if you have any question, please ask. It is always recommended when you're writing in technical writing to someone, it must be reader center not the writer's center. Therefore, it is not suggested in the cover letter because it's a technical writing, right? In your cover letter say, um, I am looking forward to hearing from you soon for the job interview, university interview and so on. It is better saying that um, if you have um, any available timing, I would be happy uh, to, be, uh, to be addressed and be on the phone for a few minutes with you. Um, you let them uh, decide on that. Does that make sense? Yes. So basically, like the way how you like give out the message can like, affect how they like. Absolutely, think. absolutely. So technical writing is all because of the change in people's attitude towards the message that they receive. If I write it as a reader's center, it means I am caring, and I'm what the message that I'm encoding. I am considering the audience more than myself. Which one is more effective? If I say, we shipped the order this morning, it means whatever happened is your mistake. And then your order has been shipped this morning. It means I care about you. Does that, does that make any difference? Yes. Good. And then if I say, I'd be happy to report that, or you'll be glad to know that. So it's always important to write it down. It's the reader's center, you the audience, because my message, I'm not writing a note to myself. I'm encoding a message for a purpose. I am solving an issue. I am sending a message to someone or some companies and so on. And I want them 
to consider that message. Therefore, they are the center. The reader, the audience is the center, not the other way around. So this is very important. And at times, how many times your, your instructors or your professors were telling you, don't use I, don't use we, and then you never knew why, right? Mm -hmm. Now you realize like the message should serve a purpose. The purpose is to be decoded by the audience. The audience is the center. I am not the center. The writer is not the center. If I receive a message, I am the center because the, uh, the, the writer of the message, again, the other way around or then the reverse pattern, they need to consider you as the, as the reader, right? Mm -hmm. So this is very, very important to realize and try to change that analytical way of thinking when it comes to technical writing. Anything at, at the higher level at high schools and universities and colleges, they're all considered as technical writing, technical professional writing, before you get into the business ambience. And it is very important to change that tone. And to be honest with you, when you change the practice pattern, the more you practice it, the easier it becomes for you to do that. Um, courtesy in the language and be courteous and politeness, of course, is always mandatory and focus on the positive side. It is important to emphasize what you can do rather than what you cannot do. Try to avoid negative wording and phrasing no, not, never, none, is, and can't, don't. So avoid doing that because it creates that kind of a negative vibe within. And of course, nowadays, the network that you have had you turn head 10 years from now and then you see the same circle of people it, to be to be courteous and polite you need to focus on the reader as much as possible you use you unless it is the result of blaming um if there is a negative connotation to it i don't need to say you made a mistake for example you can say this might have been a misunderstanding without addressing you or anyone else effective use of passive verb is avoiding assigning blame so mistakes were made instead of you made the mistake. Does that make any sense? Yes. So if there is a challenge, if there is an error to avoid blaming someone, passive voice is a good technique for you to be done. And traditional accepted form of the courtesy and politeness. I'm sure that like ever since that we've been very young, said say please, say thank you. Gender neutral phrasing that we discussed not long ago is very important. Plural forms is very courteous and important and referring to a specific person that you know uh, their gender by saying he or she is okay. But if they're binary, for example, nowadays, um, we have uh, inclusion and diversity in our terminology and vocabulary that we're constantly using it. So it is very important to, to address. Negative phrasing is, uh, is detrimental, honestly. If I say, for example, we can't process your claim because the necessary forms have not been completed, it means I'm blaming someone. The constructive phrasing instead would be, your claim can be processed as soon as we receive the necessary forms. What does it mean? It means you didn't do it and please do it. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. And um, we do not take phone calls after 3 p.m. You can say, you try to contact us between this time and that time instead of negative. So we talked about it. <clears throat> I want you to take a picture of this page since we're getting close to the end of the session. And I want you to revise this email in a positive tone, revise it in a constructive tone, in a technical style of writing. This is the this is the, are you with me? Yes. Perfect. So take a picture of this specific one and then you need to revise and edit and proofread it for next session. Next session when we come to class, you start reading it to me. And so when you do that, the focus is constructive writing, change the, if you like, you can change the grammar. We don't add any extra information to it. We just try to um, make sure that we have the proper tone to it because um, it's writing to the project manager to be given. So there's a short email that you need to revise it. Okay. okay. Any question?
Um, so like the homework is basically like revised us email. Right? That's right. Yeah. If you want me to send it to you, I'll be happy to do so. I'll 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 send it in your chat box. Let me do that right now. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect. So this is maybe easier for you to save it somewhere. And um, I want you to revise it. When you revise it, make sure that your writing is a constructive, uh, constructively phrased and in a positive tone based on anything that you have. Proofread, edit, but don't, don't forget that 40, 20, 40, okay? Sorry? Don't forget that 40, 20, 40, the proofreading, okay. editing, revising, and so on. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ophelia. Thank you. I'll see you next session. Bye. Thank you. Bye.